Welcome to Season 5 of She Ventures. I am your host, Doria Lavanino. She Ventures is a podcast about women and their work and life pivots. I believe in the power of storytelling. I also believe that if you change one woman's life, you start to change a family or a community. Our mission is to elevate the diverse stories of everyday women in their work. One promise, no mansplaining ever. Sit back, listen, and hit subscribe. We'd love to hear from you. You can find us at sheventurespodcast.com. After college, she started in marketing and interior design in her native country, Lithuania, before pivoting to entrepreneurship. In 2009, she started market research and development of a feminine hygiene company called Gentle Day, which makes panty liners and menstrual pads with a patented design. Her feminine hygiene products started as an idea and over time became known in several European countries. In 2016, she introduced her products to the United States and they are known under a company name of Genial Day, where she has expanded her offerings to include also now menstrual cups and period underwear. And if you order from Genial Day right now, for every product you buy, one box of pads will be sent to help Ukrainian refugees, women and girls who are displaced and experiencing period poverty. Here to talk to us today about starting a business with a social conscience from scratch is CEO and founder of Gentle Day and Genial Day, Vilmante Marke Vicene. Welcome <laughs> to She Ventures. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you for introduction and thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. We have been going back and forth for a while, and I've very much been very interested in what you're doing. And I thought it'd be great for listeners to hear a little bit about your origin story. Being from Lithuania, what comes to mind when you think of your childhood? I was growing up in USSR at that time, and when I was 15 years old, we got our independence, Lithuania got its independence back. So I was in all those, you know, in my teenage years, I was experiencing all this euphoria of getting freedom back. So I love my country and I've been like patriotic about that. But also I lived in the United States for five years too. So as an American, I really don't know. I know in history class, we learned about perestroika, what was it like before and after, if you could just give us a feel? It was very different, you know. I still remember, like, uh, we didn't have much stuff in the stores, you know, because I was living in the United States. I know how that was. But also when we got our independence back, we, we kind of opened up. Before that, we were closed, very closed country, or a whole uh, USSR was very closed. We couldn't go abroad. We couldn't travel. We could just travel in USSR area, or if we would like to travel somewhere, we need visas everywhere. And it was very hard to leave USSR because it was, you know, very strict system. Even simple things like toilet paper was not available in stores. So you can imagine it was not, not a good thing. One kind of bread, one kind of sausage... <laughs> If there was something good in store, the lines would go like long, long lines waiting to get good shoes or good coat. Everyone was dressed in same clothes. Or if somebody's, uh, let's say, friends or parents would go abroad, they would bring something like from abroad. That was like, ooh, that was so cool, you know, and everybody was... Wanted to have the same. So it was very, very different what we are right now. And it was not fun. But, you know, growing up as a child, of course, we had a lot of fun with friends outside, playing outside. There was no computer. There was no 
nothing like right now. So we had a lot of, still we had a lot of fun as kids, you know, growing up. So good and bad. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think often as children, we also don't know any different. We really don't have anything to compare it to, right? It's also so timely to me that Zelensky addressed our Congress. It was an incredible thing to watch. I've never, as an American in my lifetime, seen such bipartisan support of him and the country and what they're going through. And it brought tears to my eyes, honestly, to think about, he talked about candlelight and how people may be having Christmas by candlelight, but it's not necessarily by choice. Yeah, and hearing what people say right now in Ukraine, you know, the, the local people, they say, we don't care if we don't have heat, if we don't have uh, light, we want to be free. And that was the same in Lithuania in, in so many years ago, you know. So we got lucky to have at least the amount of uh, fight, you know, over Russian army. So we also had some tanks in, in our capital city. So it was a little scary, you know, and people didn't care about their lives. They would go to the, on the streets they would go and uh, be willing to fight for its freedom. So I really respect and know what's going on in U Ukraine right now and how hard it, it is for those people. And to your point, Lithuania, I learned last night, I probably should know this, was the first country in the Soviet bloc to get its independence. So you were the, the first one and then many followed when they saw what you were able to do. But the United States helped us a lot. So it, it was without its support, I don't think we could be where we are right now. So it's very important, you know, for small countries to have support of such big countries like United States. So it was, I think, like most important thing for us. You are helping in your own way as a, I assume, small to medium-sized business owner. It's very small. <laughs> Yes. Very small? That, Very that's, small. That's great. It's not even and medium, yes. It's beautiful what you're doing. I know that earlier this year, you had donated 9,000 menstrual products to, I believe it was the Lithuanian Red Cross. Yes, yes. I just wondered in 2022, do you have a figure of, of how many pads you've been able to donate? Yes, we, we've been donating for like all year round and uh, till now we have donated about 20,000 different items of hygiene products. So it's underwear, it's, it's cups, it's pads. So for our small country, it's a big number, but you know, in, in this, how much they need of everything, it's very, very tiny. So, but we, we're trying to, to help at least what we can do, you know. Well, I will tell you this. My daughter, I'm not going to say which one because they are very private, but one of them wears period underwear. And after our podcast, I will buy some because I also want to ensure that we're able to support your effort in helping Thank Ukrainian you so much. women Thank and girls. You. Absolutely. And that's for all, all the audience. If you go to the website, which we'll mention at the end of the podcast, you, by buying any product, are helping Ukrainian women and girls who've been displaced by this war. You have two bachelor's degrees, initially in business administration and then later on in interior design. Can you speak to us from the perspective of how it influenced your pivot into entrepreneurship? What were you doing early in your career? And then how did you pivot? It's not like two bachelor's degrees. I have one in business administration. And then when I was 30 years old, I uh, graduated interior design actually in the United States while I was living there. What I noticed that many people, I don't know, in that age, in 30s, they already know what they want. Because when I was a student in a business administration in 19 years old, 20 years old, I didn't know what I want, you know? It was popular occupation, and I knew I, I will have a job if I will have this degree, you know, so I did that. And then in my 30s, when I already had my two kids, I decided I want to do something for myself. I want to create. So, and I was always very into interior design because my, my father was like carpenter. He built furniture. So 
I was always around this, uh, this, you know, so it was very close to me. I was also thinking about uh, fashion design. It was two options, either fashion design or interior design. But I went with more practical one <laughs> to have better, you know, money in this field. That's the story. That's important. Money it does help make decisions, right? Creation and working with the interior, it's, it's, you're always creating something. And that what was drawing me to that, you know. So how did initially called Gentle Day, or is still called Gentle Day in Europe, how, how did that come about? It was very accidentally. Again, you know, I, once I finished the uh, interior design, we came back to Lithuania, and it was 2007. A lot of people were buying houses, so I was into that field, and I could work. I could be as an de- interior designer. But then 2008 came with crisis. And, of course, nobody was buying houses. Nobody needed interior designers anymore. Everybody was saving money for more important things. So here I was like, again, you know, like, what should I do now? You know, I still can maybe find some clients, but it was hard. I was open-minded about the ideas, you know, what comes to me. One day, my friend gave me center pads, which were totally different from the pads I was using, like buying in the stores. But the problem was that these pads weren't available in stores. They were not easy to get. They were very expensive. So I was on a mission, like I have to find these pads somewhere, Alibaba, (laughs) you know, whatever. (laughs) Yes. The good thing, I was good in English, so without English language, I wouldn't be here where I am right now, because I knew only Lithuanian and Russian at that time, you know, from little ages, but then English, of course, in school, university, and that really helped me. So once uh, those paths kind of changed the way I felt about my period, and that's what I say to about our brand, because it changes how women feel about their period, because it's... It's a hypoallergenic, you don't feel rash, you don't feel skin irritation. And I started differently perceive menstruation as a person because I always was thinking like it's it's bad thing, it's annoying, I don't want that. But once I start working with the, my brand, you know, introduce those pads, I changed my mind totally and completely. And right now I'm at this age where menopause will kick in some, somewhere in a couple of years. You and me both, sister. (laughs) Yeah, but I don't want that to end. I still want my menstruation. So, you know, so that was the idea. I got the product. I really loved it. It changed uh, the way I felt. I wanted to other women to let have this great product. So I found the uh, inventors of this product. It has that strip, like an ionic strip, which changes like bacteria and and odor. It's all natural. It's kind of interesting, but we found these inventors. We went to China. We talked to them. uh, We wanted our brand. And I didn't know nothing about building your own brand. Even I was graduated uh, in business uh, school, but you know, it, it didn't give me anything. And then after like 10 years, of graduation, it was so much different. And in the United States, it's very very common to build a brand. People know how to do that. In Lithuania, we didn't have brands till USSR uh, collapsed, you know. It was one big uh, government's brand, you know. So I didn't well, have all this. Well, people were surviving. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't have this uh, experience. So I had to learn a lot. Uh, of course, Google was my main uh, major teacher. <laughs> Professor Google, yes. Yes, yes. So, so that's, that's how little by little from interior design a designer, I became graphic designer because I create all our packaging, like visuals, marketing stuff. So it was good. It was not too hard for me from one to another, you know. Surely the brand aspect of it, I understand. But, but being a business owner, as you've said, you don't learn that in school. Even if they say that you do, you like, there's nothing like doing. 
one of the things that struck me about your LinkedIn is you wrote about how, I believe it was in 2009 through 2011, you really entered a period of trying the, the product, getting user feedback. And that is like what everyone talks about, right? Is iteration and making sure that you're listening to your customers and giving them what they want. And it sounds like you did that. Was that something that you knew intuitively to do or how, how did that come about? I think so, because usually what I do, I always kind of take from my perspective. If I would be a customer, what would I do? If I would be a customer, how would I see this advertisement? If I would be a customer, how would I feel about the products? And of course, uh, my daughter was growing up uh, close, you know, to my side. So she was uh, my tester, you know, of products also, you know, uh, me as a woman and I take myself as average woman with no like special needs, you know, so probably of most of the women like, like we are. So I was more like you say, intuitively uh, taking everything. Of course, all my friends would try products. I would go get feedback from them. Then I would hear a very good thing was uh, going into expos. We have in Lithuania, like small expos in the United States. It's huge. It's usually B2B. And there was B2C. And with B2C, I was getting this feedback from women. They would say, oh, I was running around and trying to get your products because at first we didn't have our products in all stores here in Lithuania. It wasn't j just some pharmacies. So they would go like change three places to find our product. So I knew it was really good and different product from what it was in the stores. So I say like we open different category or subcategory in hygiene product uh, market. So you mentioned you were in stores in Lithuania and then presumably you had to expand. And then I was wondering in the EU, I have two questions. One is, what is it like to deal with the regulatory aspect of getting a product approved? Let's start with that, actually. So you don't have to remember the second question. With EU, it's not hard because we are EU in our EU union, Lithuania. Is, so once we bring products to Lithuania, it's already have all the requirements for Lithuania and it's almost the same in other EU countries, so you don't have to change much. And with sanitary napkins, even cups, tampons, there is not big, um, how to say, factories has to have certification. So I always look, if I look for the product, I always look that the factory has ISO 9000. Good if they have ISO 1400, 1400. It's like environmental management. So I know if they have that, it means that they conserve water, raw materials, you know. It's like those two certificates, is when I look for the factories, that's where I look first. If they have that, then next uh, steps like other certifications, but it's not like... I saw 9,000, it's like the must. We certify sanitary pads, uh, wet wipes in Europe for Ecotex. It's like ecological certification that I do myself. I send products each year to certified textile institute. They test the products for different various chemicals. Then either you get certificate or not. So from... 2011, we started to certify our products. Until this day, we still have the certificate. We always renew it. It was also Google. Again, you know, I was trying to find certification for sanitary pad as a whole product, not just like the top layer, because usually it's just top cotton layer. I wanted to check whole product if it's good <laughs> or not good. I found this uh, certifying company, not company, uh, organization. So it needs to get approved in Lithuania, which, yes, is, is a part of the EU. Was that process cumbersome or was it pretty straightforward? You know, like in United States, it's different with these kind of products because they go under medical devices like sanitary pads, cups and tampons. They go under medical devices in Lithuania or in EU. 
they don't go under medical devices. Therefore, there's no strict procedures to, to bring the products to U European Union. So with different other products, I'm not sure. Like I know the, the cosmetic products, which we also have like deodorant, natural deodorant, intimate foam. We have to notify those in Euro uh, Euro European Union, but it's very easy. There is a website where you go, you notify, you list all the ingredients, you know, attach the files. That's it. You got the notification. You have the number. So it's not, not hard. I guess my only question would be, if a woman were to, I don't know, develop uh, some kind of reaction to a product, how does the EU keep track of that? <sighs> we never had such situation, but usually if something happens with the product, you have to go to, there is different organization. One is customer care, government uh, establishment. You can go there and tell them what's happened. Different story is with like drugs, medicine, the ones which goes under medical devices, that's different story. But here, since it's not medical device, people can complain to like customer care organization, or there is like non-food organization, which also if clients writes them like a this product was bad, I had bad reaction. Then this organization comes to the company and they check the product. They can take the product and they can do testing with the product. So that's how it goes. And today, how many stores and countries are you in, in Europe? We have some distributors in different countries. We are also Latvia, Estonia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Netherlands, Italy... UK and Poland. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but it's not easy. To have distributors, it's not that easy for them, I would say. You know, we try to help them, but again, they don't want to invest so much in the advertisement. So, of course, since it's our brand, you know, we have to take care of that. But online store, we have gentledy.com online store, which is for all European Union. So women from any European Union country can purchase from our website. We did that because what we noticed, our Lithuanian girls, you know, they would move to different countries to live, but they say there's no such products in those countries. How can I get them? You know, so we opened the store just for women who are from different countries. So we ship to them. But of course, we get clients, not only Lithuanians, you know, we get different women, but it's it's not easy to advertise in whole Europe. Of course, you can do like Google advertisement, Facebook, but then it is each country is different. So you still have to focus on to each country because we have different languages, we have different cultures. It's not like you're going to have European Union and whole area. No, you still have to focus in different countries in European Union. That makes perfect sense to me. Having um, my father was Italian and I know how different the cultures are. I can only imagine when you started, did you have to get a loan or did you just slowly build up? We slowly build up. Me and my, my husband started in Lithuania here, and uh, we started from our funds, so it's, it's self-funded. We never took a loan. Actually, we have one loan. We have one loan in the United States in, in COVID those years, you know, when, when yes, it was P a little... PPP loan? Yes, it was confusing, and then we had to order more products just to get better price, and we had to put, of course, invest more money. So we took one loan, but it's not huge. It's, it's a small loan and uh, it helps us to kind of move forward a little bit. But right now we're starting to bring it back. You return the loan. So <laughs> I love your story in that every so often I will get an entrepreneur who finds a product accidentally out of their own need. And I feel like that tends to be the more successful products if the person really pursues it and believes in it, which is the case with you. And I really admire what you've done Thank in you all so of much. Europe. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, and, Doria. And then the patent, is that difficult in Europe? 
It costs a lot. It costs a lot. It takes about two years. It depends, again, probably on the patent, because uh, we patented our period panties. It has different kind of crotch where you can hide pad wings. So I patented that. Yeah, but it takes time. It costs a lot. We couldn't patent in all Europe, so we just patented in Lithuania. That's the reason, because it's just too expensive to cover all the region. It's not for small company, you know, it's for big ones. Exactly. I, I was going to say that because I once looked into patent, pat, I don't know why I'm having so much trouble with that word today, patenting, <laughs> <laughs> getting a patent for something. And not only was it expensive to file, but the other piece of it is you have to then defend your patent against people who and that is where it get, can get incredibly expensive for a small yes. business owner. And what I feel, I feel like it's maybe okay for marketing, but it's not like we're going to go and get some other companies who make something similar. You know, we're not going to sue them. So I don't know if it's really a thing to have. You know, it's good for marketing. It shows that it's an innovative product. It's something different about it, but... You have to register your brand name, that's for sure. And uh, in the United States, why we have different brands, you know, for Lithuania and, and United U, U, Europe Union, we have Gentle Day and then Genial Day for United States. We weren't, weren't lucky here because there is big brand, very big brand, which has uh, Gentle Glide tampons. And when we tried to register Gentle Day, they wrote us a note like you cannot either we go to court or you have to refuse gentle day and you know whatever so we re refuse gentle day we found something similar like genial day and that's why it's genial day in the united states but it's more investment now we have to deal with different packaging it's not good thing to have if we would know that before we started here in Lithuania, probably we would go with Genial D also in, Unite, in, in Europe, EU. But we didn't know at that time. We started company in 2009 here in the EU. And then in 2016, we came to United States. So we couldn't know that. Hindsight is always 2020, and I, I feel like first-time entrepreneurs always have these things that they're learning. I wouldn't have known that either. But now... Now I realize that like one of the very first things one should do when they start a company is to really research the brand name, as you're saying, not just for the country that they're in, but globally, just to ensure or understand what the risks are. Yes. And again, it costs money. Registration costs money. You have to have an agent who, who does that. So for small business, it's a lot of money, but you have to do that. If you think globally, you have to do that. In the U.S., was the process as simple as the EU? Uh, since we don't do registration, we give it to agent. They know better. But, but I know that our EU agent, she couldn't register our brand in United States. So we had to find another agent in United States who could do that. It's not hard, I think. It takes time. But you have to know what you're doing. You know, maybe, again, you can Google, but it takes time. I would prefer to give that to, to professionals. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think what you're saying is so true, right? At some point, you do need to outsource certain things if you can afford to do so, because it makes it so difficult to try to do it yourself. In the past 20 years, one of the things that I've noticed, and I'm sure you have as well, is that the feminine hygiene market has exploded. And I feel like part of that is because there are more women, not enough, but more women who are involved in thinking about feminine hygiene as a woman. And so the market size, just for listeners, it was $22.2 billion in 2021 globally, and it's projected to reach 30 2.3 billion in 2028. So it's growing at about 5.5% a year. In your view, what is the role women are playing in the feminine hygiene market? I would say the major role <laughs> because we are the users of those products and 
We need good, comfortable products, which wouldn't cause us skin irritations, uncomfort leaks and stuff like that. So, of course, there are companies ruled by men, but as you say, I'm doing it from my heart and from my needs, you know, so I know what I'm doing. If it's run by men, again, different story probably, but they are willing to take more risk and to grow faster maybe and to get investors. I think we are because we are the, the ones using those products. We know what we need. With the market being so open right now, not like only the market, but like factories, you can find factory online, you don't have to travel, you can just uh, make everything, you know, on e emails and stuff. So it got much easier to, to build your business, to build your brand. And as I see right now, that switch in the market, I see a lot of new brands. And what I see in the United States, like maybe, I don't know if it's our mistake, because we came in 2016, but we are still very, very small in the United States. We cannot go, we cannot jump into higher level of like sales, more sales. It's, it's still very small. We're still doing better in Europe than in the United States. Even United States market, it's huge, but it's not easy. Smaller markets are easier. When we were going to United States market, I thought, that's it, United States, it's great. You know, we're going to do how many years past? Six. And we still, tiny, tiny, we make only, I would say, 20% of revenue, what we make in Lithuania. Can you imagine? Lithuania oh, is only wow. 2.8 million people. Here we are big brand. We are in top and some in like pharmacies, we are top brands. Even like always there is, we have always, we have a brand. We have a Libres, different brands, and we are top brand in pharmacies. In United States is different story. And what I see with brands coming into United States or starting, what they would do, they would put a lot of money in marketing, millions, I would say, because nothing really works. Tens doesn't work. Hundreds, thousands doesn't work. You know, you have to put millions and then you have to draw investors into your company and maybe sell and maybe keep just very little of your company. Then you can, you know, you scale. From your pocket, like us, I always look at the uh, Spanx uh, founder, Sarah. Oh, Sarah Blakely. Yes. Yes, Sarah Blakely. I took her ma master class even. She's my like role model because she said they grew their brand from its own money again. $5,000. She started yeah. with 5000 She says in her garage. I, yeah. I, I believe her. Why would yeah. she lie? And, right? and I believe that. We will be there one day, but <laughs> you will. It takes time, yes. you know. We don't want to sell our company. Yeah, Sarah, I, I think you need to listen to She Ventures <laughs> and 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 yeah. you know play a little role here. So, in the U.S., then is it your website only, or are you trying to find distribution partners? We're in like Bad Bath and Beyond. Uh, we were. Oh wow! I say we were because we are not there anymore. We were in C in CVS in Florida. We were in like Lucky's. Uh, there was Lucky's. I, th I think around New York or something. But then because we wouldn't put millions into advertisement, women don't know when they look on the shelf what is genial day. You know, so we. We were for two years probably on shelves and stores for three. And then we just took our products out because it wasn't worth it. Because you still have to pay for those stores and uh, advertisement. You have to do promotions uh, every like three months. So we couldn't make it. So now our products are available like natural food stores. And in, in some good ones, they're year one in, in California. We are in like smaller scale stores and we work with, with three like distributors of uh, like major natural product distributors and we sell online too. So yeah. My father told me this once, I don't know if it's true, but that you also have to pay in a grocery store for like where your product is on the shelf. So that also plays a role in how consumers relate to it. 
we didn't have that fee, but uh, you have to pay slotting fee, which is very huge. Once you get into the store, you have to pay one time slotting fee. And that could be from 2000 per one SKU to like 15000 per one SKU. And if you have, we did four, four SKUs, you, so you have to time that. $60,000. You know? Yeah, so we wouldn't do that for like 15, but we would pay like 2,000, like maybe 5,000 per all. But yeah, it's, there are different fees involved and, <laughs> and especially it's painful when you have to take your product out of the store. Then you lose oh, all the yeah. profit that you had because you have to pay for that too. Ah. Uh. That's frustrating, and I guess a setback, but I have a feeling you're going to find your way around it. I think we will, yeah. You will. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely. One of the things that I love about your brand is your focus on education, and I, I think that that is so paramount because girls oftentimes aren't necessarily taught enough about menstruation, or it's stigmatized as something, ooh, gross, which it's not. It's a bodily function. So talk to our listeners a little bit about the role of education in your company. It's very important because what I have learned in 13 years being in this business, I want to bring this knowledge to women and especially to girls. Since I had a daughter who was growing up together with a brand, she's 21 right now, but she was 11 when we started. So it was her teenage years, you know, Perfect. so... Yeah, so it was you, you, had, you had her, so you could, you could test your product. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then I know how it is important to talk to her about menstruation. She would look at my body. She would, you know, explore it. And then she would see her body. It's very important to have that connection with your daughter. And I wanted to bring that out because... I know how it is important. I don't want our girls to feel scared or afraid of menstruation, to think that it's horrible. And especially if she doesn't know what is menstruation, to have this blood in your panties and think you're going to die. That's, I don't know. It's just... I'll tell you something. I, I consider myself fairly educated about, about women. And when one of my daughters got her period, I obviously failed to make this clear, but she thought when she got her period, that she would then bleed every day for the rest of her life. And she was so upset. And I couldn't figure out why until we had this conversation. And then I said, oh, oh no, 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 no. That's not how this works. Yeah. But sometimes a, a parent can be well-intentioned and you think you've said everything that needs to be said, but that's why we made like very nice, cute books I will show you <laughs> for girls like period book and I put all it's done by me you know I put all the information like what is the discharge what because it's very interesting what is this this discharge they never had that and now they have it so we explain you know when they're gonna have menstruation what is this so this is very important and we have those first period kits where mothers can buy for girls but what I also did uh, we also have this project like Girl supports girl. When mother buys uh, this kit for girl, the other kit goes to girl in need who doesn't have a mother maybe. She never had this conversation. At least she gets this book and she can read it and to know more about it. So this is very, very important, especially from young age. And sometimes we get those questions from girls like, I got my period. How should I tell my mom about that? And that's so sad, you know? It's, it's like, why you cannot say, why you feel so embarrassed about that? So we want to change that, you know? I think that's wonderful. And the stigma really does still exist. Even in the United States, I have two daughters, and they often will ask, can you see anything like from behind? Like they're terrified at the idea of having some village or, and of course that, that would be embarrassing, but like in their mind, it would be devastating. And I think that is partially like internalized stigma. Yes. Yes. And then another thing is then women think that period should hurt like PMS. We always have to have cramps or some kind of pain, you know, and that's what we want to change too, because our menstruation is a mirror to our health. 
if something wrong with your menstruation, if something wrong with your cycle, you have to look deeper because even cramps, they shouldn't be there. If you eating well, like uh, different food, good healthy food, if you taking care of your hormones, if you not stressed, stress is very big. Stress is a big one. I was going to say. It's very big Cute. for our hormones. And then we get cramps. And so we have to really kind of work with our head, what's in our mind, and then take care. Sport is very important. Sometimes women would say, you know, oh, I just want to lay if it's hurting. But little sport is very good. And it's the worst thing you can do sometimes is to just lay on your bed in a stationary position, right? Yes, even just take a walk. You don't have to exercise hard, but just take a walk. Do a little yoga. And that will help because the, the, here are muscles which makes uh, the cramps, you know, the, the muscles in our uterus. So you have to kind of keep it moving. The blood circulation has to be there. So... That's what we also trying to teach women that it's not normal if you're always getting pain. You have to look deeper. I love that. And a pill is not always a solution, no. which is very American. It's like, oh, you have pain, take two Tylenol. No, it, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very but American. Yes, it is. So we're trying to change that. <laughs> I, lo I love it. And the other thing that I've noticed is that more and more brands, and my daughters are both very into this, are into non-synthetic, organically derived products. And I think your products are, are like that. And so yes. it has that been something that has been requested? Is it, it, do you think it's like one of the major selling points of your products? Uh, you know, there are some... Always will be people who cares about health and about environment and always will be those people who don't care about their health or environment, you know. So unfortunately, there are more people who don't care about their health or environment still, you know, I think. I'm not sure what's the percentage, but sometimes when I ask some questions on like Instagram, I still see like maybe 30% are more into sustainable and then about 70, 60% doesn't care about that. So this was something what I care and what I have noticed on myself once I, you know, start using those products. And it was, for me, it was very, very important that those products will not have chemicals, you know, some harmful chemicals. So eventually, especially I would say maybe women when they get their babies and they start learning more and more about all those environmental chemicals, how bad it is for your baby. Of course, you start thinking about yourself, how bad it is for you. <laughs> so, and the funny thing sometimes is, especially here in Lithuania, there are a lot of teens who are using our products and then they get their mothers to use our product, not the... That's so cool. That's yes. A, they're brand ambassadors. Yes, yeah. yes. And that's so interesting because we don't advertise for teens. We just advertise for cautious uh, women, you know, and then teen girls, they get their mother, mothers out of those chemical pads or, or tampons. So that's, that's very interesting. That's really wonderful. And one of the arguments I do hear, and I, I haven't looked at your product pricing, but I do hear this, is that one of the reasons why people choose not to go organic is because it's more expensive. Is that the case with your products? It's more expensive. I, yes, it is more expensive. But as I say, with sanitary pads, we have different sanitary pads than other organic uh, brands. It has very high absorbency. When I do those tests with absorbency, our pads absorb 120 milliliters, while other absorbs about 20 milliliters, 30 milliliters, even 10 milliliters. So it's very, very little. Of course, you don't need this huge amount. You're not going to have so much blood, but you feel more comfortable for longer period of time with such pads as Genial Day because you don't have to change so often. I remember I bought to try, you know, when I started this business, I bought organic pads to try. I used 10 pads in two days, whole package, and it cost about like $5. So I was like, how women can, it's too expensive. 
with our pads, you know, you, you use like two, three pads per day, you know, it's enough. Because it has the strip which protects from bacteria and odor. So it's not like you compromising your, your health because you're using the pad longer. So it's more beneficial and it's more even economic and it's less even uh, trash, you know, what you have to throw. So our pads are different and then with organic cotton, is it's nice, it's great, but it's not always very comfortable for women. So you have to find uh, another choice. But all the organic products are more pricey. And especially if you want to make like plastic biodegradable, then it gets even more pricey. Like we checked the prices because we have this plastic, which we make with calcium carbonate. It's more like sustainable, but again, it's not organic or biodegradable. So we wanted to change the biodegradable. So our pads would cost even 40% more than it costs now. So at this point, you kind of have to choose, you know, it's not, nobody gonna afford such expensive pads. So the interesting thing too, I was thinking as you were talking is like, it's kind of like preventative care in medicine. There are certain things that you might put money in to prevent things down the road. If you look at a, your product in that way or any product that's organic or natural based, it might be more expensive to produce, but in the long run, the carbon footprint or name whatever you like is going to be less. And so really in the scheme of things, it isn't more expensive. Yeah. And let's take some women who would get like skin irritation while using some kind of pads. Then they have like this dermatitis or vulvitis where they have to buy some medicine to kind of treat it or like infections like BV or yeast infection. Sometimes we get that from pets too. And then again, you have to treat that with medicine. You have to pay those treatments. So, but you have to educate people. As me, I was the same till, you know, 34 years. I thought period, it has to hurt. You have to have the skin irritation because the, this is something together comes with period. I thought the same. So right now, from my experience, I know that was not the case. What has been the most challenging and the most rewarding part of being a female entrepreneur? Challenges is always like <laughs> every day is a <laughs> challenge. <laughs> because maybe the biggest challenge is to keep the brand growing. You have to always think about growing your brand investing in new products, creating new products, because if you stop, you stop, you die. If you stop, you die. That's, that's the rule of uh, being in a business. As a woman entrepreneur, I'm lucky because I have my husband on my side who I can talk to and we can discuss and he can give me some advices. So it's very healthy family atmosphere. Even I talk with my kids, now they're grown-ups, you know, my son, he's 25 already, so we're trying to get him into business too. So it's always good to have this nice surrounding, you know, where I can, I'm not by myself. If I would be by myself, it would be very, very hard. And with people you trust, right? <laughs> yes, people you trust and uh, to get some advices. You always need advice from someone because to take decision by one person, just myself, would be very, very hard. It's easier, you know, f to be a woman entrepreneur, to have someone by your side, maybe some mentor or so somebody who can give you some advice, but then you're going to do your way, you know, but you still have to get some, some opinion. Absolutely. That makes so much sense to me. What would you say has been your biggest win? My biggest one, I would say I do what I love. And that's very important. I'm not stressed. I love my job. I love creating. I love creating packaging, creating products, thinking about new period panties design to make it more comfortable. So I'm very lucky that I found my passion. And then this passion, even I can live from. So I think this is my biggest uh, reward. I think it's awesome. I think it is so <laughs> great. And I, I, I'm very inspired by you. Based on your experience today, 
What tips would you have for a young female entrepreneur who's starting out? Sometimes, you know, it just, um, the timing is so interesting because I never thought I will be an entrepreneur. I never thought I will be a businesswoman because even I've graduated business administration. I never thought I will be in the business. I didn't like it. You know, it wasn't interesting. <laughs> And now what I see, and people sometimes call me like businesswoman. No, I'm not businesswoman. I'm more like a creator, developer of products. But the most biggest thing is actually to find what you love to do. This is very important to find what you love to do, what you're passionate about. And if you are passionate enough, you will succeed. I don't see any other way. But you have to be very patient, consistent. We are very patient with the United States market <laughs> and business. <laughs> I'm very patient about it. Before COVID, I wanted to close this, but I'm still trying to succeed, you know. So you have to be patient. Of course, you have to take into account money, what you earn. So don't lose all your, you know, money. You still have to live and you have to keep your family. So you have to really measure everything, to be patient and to be consistent and to do what you love to do. This is just from my perspective, what I do. So, but everyone is different. So. That's a wonderful advice. And uh, with that, I'd like to close the podcast with you letting us know where people in the United States and Canada can find your products. And then also in Europe, we don't have many listeners there, but a few. So in Canada, uh, our products are available actually in Whole Foods. There's not many Whole Foods stores, but we do have like, look in natural food stores. You will find our products there, Genial Day. Then we have on Amazon and we have uh, online. No, we don't ship to Canada. It's too expensive. So we don't ship to Canada <laughs> from United States, unfortunately. But it's available like well.ca, there is like big uh, organic product store, Amazon. So here you can find in Canada and in the United States, of course, Amazon, our geniald.com page, join our Instagram, learn more about health, join our TikTok. <laughs> so what is I your will... Instagram handle? It's a genial day, genial with this, the dash, not dash. I know what you mean. It's a space, but you put it in between the two yeah, words. Yeah, so yeah. So yeah. Genial Day, look for that. And then it's the same for Canada, Genial Day. And then TikTok, we have Genial Day and Gentle Day. Like I'm trying to do both. So I'm not very consistent there yet, but I, I promise I'd be better. <laughs> I completely understand. And people can also buy on your website in the U.S., yes, correct? Yes, in the U.S., geniald.com, yes. And then, of course, some natural food stores, like smaller stores, uh, they can look for the products there. And Amazon, of course, they can find it there. If you were to get an offer from a large company that wanted to buy your brand, would you consider it? Uh, uh, it depends. At this point, it's still my baby. I really love what I do. And if I sell it, I don't know what, <laughs> you know, what's next. So what if it's a crazy amount of money? Like what if all of a sudden I'm just, this is like a crazy scenario. Let's say a company comes to you and says, we're going to offer you $500 million. Would you take it? I think I take it and then I will <laughs> build another brand. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Not like competitor, but I was still will be in business and creating something. I love underwear. I would go maybe into underwear category. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> that was like a real hypothetical, but you never know. So, you know, with Sarah Blakely, yeah. she's listening. She may offer you that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Doria. It was great pleasure. You've been listening to She Ventures. Like what you heard? You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and sign up for our newsletter so you never miss a show.